G'day everyone, I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to our webinar series. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I live and work. Canberra is Ngunnawal country. Sovereignty was never ceded and it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past and present and also extend a welcome to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders uh, people joining us today. During the pandemic, the Australia Institute has been doing these webinars at least once a week, but sometimes many more than that. For example, this week we've got four webinars on. So to make sure that you um, <clears throat> have all the details for all of those, please stay in touch on our website at tai.org.au forward slash webinars so that you don't miss out. And just a few tips before we begin to help things run smoothly today, particularly if you're joining us for the first time. If you hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should be able to see a Q&A function where you can ask questions of our panellists, should be able to upvote questions from other people and make comments. And please keep things civil in the chat or we will boot you out. And lastly, a reminder that this discussion is being recorded and it will be posted on our website afterwards and we'll email it to everyone who's registered today. Uh, we do have a very special webinar for you today with independent member for Warringah Zali Stegall, OAM, having just introduced her climate change bill to the Federal House of Representatives. We'll watch a short video of the introduction shortly and then hear from Zali. Um, following uh, on from that, we'll hear from Australia's former chief scientist, Professor Penny Sackett, on why the science of climate change requires a robust legislated framework for climate action. And then in the second half, as usual, we'll move on to questions. I'm going to pass over now to my colleague and the Australia Institute's Climate and Energy Program Director, Richie Merzian, to properly introduce our guest today and provide us with a little bit of context for this special occasion. Thanks very much, Richie. Thank you, Ebony. And it certainly is a, a special occasion today. Uh, I'll set a little bit of the context and then introduce our guests. Uh, act boldly was the message that the UK Conservative Prime Minister Boris Johnson gave to our Prime Minister Scott Morrison just recently. And while that message might not have been taken to heart or, or even that well recorded here in Australia, it certainly was elsewhere. Um, Today, the Coalition Minister for Energy and Environment in New South Wales, Matt Keane, is proposing more renewable energy for this state than the Queensland and Victorian renewable energy targets put together, turning what was the laggard of our country in terms of state penetration of renewables into a potentially a leader. Abroad, the three largest importers of Australian coal China, Japan, and South Korea have all taken on net zero targets. They're also the three largest importers of Australia's other fossil fuel liquefied natural gas. So to put that into context, net zero means that they are setting a downward trajectory for coal, oil, and gas until it is pretty much zero. Given, Australian ex given Australia exports three quarters of its fossil fuel production, and Australia is part of the top three exporters of fossil fuels, this should be of concern, even just from an economic perspective. Of additional interest for those who haven't been watching, the United States uh, is now on track to bring forward a net zero by 2050 target. It is the second largest emitter in the world, and alongside China, the largest, and Japan, South Korea, the EU, you have a majority of the world's emissions now covered by these targets. And with the push to rejoin the Paris Agreement next year, uh, President-elect Biden has stated that he will use the US's economic power and power of example to push others to be more ambitious. And ambition, I think, is key today. So on the back of this momentum, we have one of the most prolific and outspoken champions of climate action in federal parliament, uh, Zali Stegall MP, here to introduce why we need a Climate Change Act in Australia at the federal level. Uh, whilst Zali doesn't need much of an introduction, I'll provide a short one nonetheless. She is the independent federal member for the seat of Warringah in Sydney's Northern Beaches. She's also Australia's most successful alpine skier, winning bronze in the 98 Winter Olympics and the World Championships the year after. She was a practicing barrister in commercial sports and family law. And last year, Zali contested and won the, the, par the parliamentary seat of Warringah, 
And in doing so, she upseated our former prime minister who held onto the seat for almost 25 years. And she did so on the back of a strong climate change mandate, which is manifesting here today. We are also fortunate to be joined by Professor Penny Sackett. Uh, Penny has held positions at the Princeton Institute, Institute, the Princeton Institute of Advanced Study in the US, um, the Australian National Uni, where she now has a um, honorary professorship and was our chief scientist from 2008 to 2011, where Penny provided independent scientific advice to the Australian government and was a vocal champion of evidence-based decision-making, uh, a key element of the Climate Act that we'll now hear about as well. Uh, Professor Penny Sackett is also the chair of the Australian Capital Territories Climate Change Council. And uh, I'd be remiss to not mention that the ACT also has the most ambitious climate target in Australia with net zero by 2045. So to kick things off this morning, we'll be watching a short video of the introduction of the climate change bill to federal parliament this morning by the independent member for Warringah. And you might just have to bear with me here because we don't often share videos anymore. So here we go. Can everyone see that? Yep. Excellent. Okay. The clerk. First reading, a bill for an act to establish a national climate change adaptation and mitigation framework and to establish the Climate Change Commission and for related purposes. I call the member for Warringah. I move that this bill be now read a second time. Climate change is the challenge of our time and how we respond to it as a nation and global community will have a huge impact on our future. We have seen in the US a nation divided by politics of lies and misrepresentation. I congratulate President-elect Biden on his victory and look forward to his science-based approach to key issues. I welcome his commitment on climate change and the US rejoining the Paris Agreement. Australia has already seen too many years of divisive politics around this issue. This parliament needs to unite behind a common goal to keep our way of life and Australians safe. Facts and the truth matter on this important issue. There is no more room for spin and talking points. We are not going to meet and beat our emissions reduction targets. We are not on track to keep global warming below two degrees. So the world is acting and committing to net zero by 2050. Our major trading partners are committed and working together on the solutions. They will be at the forefront of technology developments and investment. Australia is not at the table. We are falling behind. We have our handbrake firmly on. 70 per cent of our two-way trade is now covered by net zero targets in those jurisdictions. Australia faces the real threat of border carbon tariffs if we continue to fall behind the rest of the world. So it is time this parliament passed legislation that sets into law a commitment to net zero by 2050. In doing so, Australia will have effective climate change laws in place, like the UK, Germany, France and New Zealand, to name a few. Net zero by 2050 is endorsed by our states and territory governments, businesses, peak bodies, civil society groups and our trading partners. Over 80 per cent of Australians are worried about climate change impacts. There are so many reasons why we need to pass this legislation and lock in a bipartisan, sensible legislative framework to net zero. We need to take the party politics out of addressing climate change. This issue is bigger than any one party. This goes to the heart of keeping Australians safe. The government failed terribly to hear the warnings and prepare for the horrendous bushfires last summer, and we cannot let that happen again. Our success or failure as a nation to properly address climate change impacts and emissions reduction will be felt across every sector. A government that downplays the risks and urgency to act is a government that also fails to prepare Australia to build resilience and adapt. Australia is already feeling the impacts of global warming. As a recent Natural Disaster Royal Commission report showed, we are exposed to the worst of climate impacts, and these will become more severe over time. We must act decisively in the face of such a threat to our way of life, our health, our environment and our economy. The COVID-19 pandemic has given the world a prelude to widespread disruption climate change will cause. 
The recent Deloitte study found that climate change will be like having a pandemic every year from 2050. We stand to lose as much as $3.4 trillion in economic damages by 2070. But we can take the first step to avoid that legacy now with this sensible legislation. Our business community want better policy and clarity on emissions reduction plans. They want to plan their transition and long-term investment strategies. Legislating a net zero target by 2050 with five-year emissions reduction budgets provides a policy certainty and a framework to the private sector. It focuses investment on low emission technologies and accelerates the development and uptake of those new technologies. It then permits more and more ambitious five-yearly emission reduction budgets. Our doctors and the AMA and the broad health sector all identify global warming as a major health threat. Having experienced this year the widespread disruption of COVID-19, we know that policy based on factual, scientific advice is the key to success. This bill legislates for regular risk assessment, adaptation and resilience plans. We urgently need to better understand how the impacts of climate change will affect our way of life, our society, our environment and our economy. And we need to ensure a planned transition for all, as communities and workers will be more disrupted and impacted than others. Re regular risk assessment of where and how climate impacts are going to be felt from environmental impacts like heat, drought, extreme weather events, increased bushfires, water and food security, to how it will impact employment sectors and our economy. Our building sector and building codes need to address climate risks. Investment in building resilience is far more cost effective than funding disaster recovery. The longer Australia waits to implement effective adaptation plans to emerging climate change impacts, the more expensive it will become to do so. This bill establishes the Independent Climate Change Commission, who will report and advise on technology assessments. This is a collaborative effort. The bill adopts the government's annual low emissions technology statements to identify and fast track existing and emerging low emissions technologies. By transitioning to a net zero emissions economy, Australia will benefit from the jobs, productivity and growth that will be created by new clean industries. We can protect our environment and our jobs, our way of life and our children's future. Australia is uniquely positioned to prosper through this transition. We have the financial wealth, the human capacity, we have the scientific innovation, we have zero emission energy resources and potential for soil regeneration and carbon sequestration. We are uniquely placed to take advantage of the boom that is coming. This bill will enable Australia to make an immediate, positive and nationally supported response to the risks, challenges and opportunities of climate change. I cede the rest of my time to the member for Mayo and I commend this bill to the House. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, and I can see that we've got around about 900 people. Oh, hang on. Still got my YouTube on in the background. <laughs> that was disconcerting. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we've got about 900 people on the webinar with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. That was just Zali Stegel then introducing this bill in the, on the floor of the house today. Uh, she, we're very delighted that she could be with us today, but she does have to get to question time at two o'clock. So I might hand back over to you, Richie. Thanks, Ebony and, and Zali. To continue on with your presentation this morning, so the bill was based on a, a similar sort of private members bill put forward in the UK that ended up becoming their framework legislation on climate. Um, and it was adopted by a conservative government there. Do you see a similar pathway here and what role can the public play? 
Absolutely. But if I could just start by paying my respect to um, our Indigenous elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge their sorrow uh, at the price that was paid, but hope that we can all work together towards actually a better and safer future. Um, yeah, when I was elected, it was really clear for me and very important to find a sensible pathway forward for climate. We've had 10 years of very divisive policies. Um, I would say party police politics have trumped sensible politics. Um, and so it was really important for me to find a solution that actually could be bipartisan, uh, that embraces what 80% of Australians want, which is a sensible pathway forward. So the UK took that approach back in 2008. It was a private member's bill initially introduced um, to legislate the common goal. So legislate net zero by 2050 with a method. So five year emission reduction budgets. Now those budgets can become more and more ambitious as technology comes online which makes sense, this is how we do it. But we, we need that accountability. So that is how you get to that net zero by 2050 in a fiscally responsible way, because you can plan ahead. The other key elements of the bill are that we, the risk assessment, adaptation and resilience that we need to do. Sadly, because of all the inaction, we have certain impacts locked in from climate change. So we need to ensure we are, making sure our communities are safe. Um, we need to make sure we truly acknowledge all the risks that we, ha we have. And that's from extreme weather events, from bushfires. We need communities to be safe. Our building codes need to be adjusted to be climate resilient for different areas of the country. But we also need to acknowledge some communities are going to be seriously disrupted. Their employment is going to change. Communities that have relied on employment from uh, fossil fuel mining or from uh, coal-fired power generation are going to need a plan and putting your head in the sand and having local MPs telling them that nothing is going to change is not a solution because they will be exposed. So we need to plan and that is what the bill mandates. Of course, we also need the science. We need an independent climate change commission that has all those skills around the table. We've seen the benefit of a strong science fact-based approach on COVID. And I have no doubt that we can, if we just put ourselves into that position, do the same when it comes to climate change. We need to flatten the curve on our emissions because the truth matters, you know, facts really matter. Um, I think we've seen that with the US election. The Prime Minister and government MPs will say we're meeting and beating our commitments. We're not. Over the last four years, our emissions have gone up by 0.7% at a time where they desperately need to come down. So we need to change our policy. We need to step up and join the international community that has locked in net zero by 2050. Very well put in terms of the challenge in front of us. And the final point you, you mentioned was that how it needs to be fueled by the science, led by the science. And we're fortunate to have um, a representative of the scientific community um, with us here. Penny, why does, uh, why, why does the science you know, mandate you know, a stronger pathway and how does that fit into this particular bill? Oh. You're on mute, Penny. <laughs> you were very polite there. I was tried. Now, yeah, you can hear me. Yeah. Um, good. You know, um, we're currently sitting globally at about 1.1 degrees of warming. Um, and we can see aspects of that kind of a climate that, that are not safe, right? Cast our minds back to the beginning of 2020. What an extraordinary way to begin a year. Uh, with those bushfires, three billion animals lost, human lives lost, unimaginable smoke. So um, we know that 1.5 um, is, is going to challenge us as well. And we certainly don't want to go above that. Now, the time scale is also important. So it's not just enough to eventually reduce our emissions. We need to do it quickly because there's a finite emission budget uh, 
certain amount of global emissions that we can spend as a, as a globe before we've really gone past that 1.5 mark that is the, that is the um, goal of the Paris Agreement. So what's important is, is our safety, um, protecting the earth that protects us, and taking action quickly. Um, and I think one of the things I like about this bill is that it sets five-year timelines. It recognizes that um, every five years counts. In fact, every year counts. If we're going to reach net zero emissions by 2050, um, we can't wait until 2049, right? We have to start now. And in fact, those decreases in emissions need to be pretty steep to meet that target. The good news is we know how to do it. We have almost all the tools we need. We simply need to employ them. And so what I'm hoping is that this bill will be passed so that we can end 2020 a lot differently than we began it. And we can feel a lot more hopeful um, on New Year's Day of 2021. Um, we've already seen some things that have changed. Um, Richie mentioned now that both labor um, and coalition state and territory governments have net 2050 as a target, net zero 2050, and both labor and coalition state governments are acting faster and faster on renewable energy. So what could be a better time uh, than now for the national government to give support to all of our citizens, all of our local government, and in fact, um, stretch that hand across um, across the ocean. I say this as a both a U.S. citizen and an, uh, an Australian citizen. Um, what wonderful opportunities there could be uh, to work with the United States, as it has you know working toward its very ambitious goal of net zero in the energy sector by 2035. I think it's a real opportunity and I hope we take it. Mm. Well, just over the weekend, Penny, uh, of both your nations, they, they seem to have flipped in terms of which one was more climate ambitious. <laughs> um, but your, um, you know, President-elect Biden has stated that he wants to move to 100% clean energy by 2035. So within 15 years to transition in the electricity sector that's not as similar to ours, is ambitious, but I guess that's what's required. Um, you, Penny, you I had a slide that you wanted to potentially share. Would you like to do that now? Yes. Um, let me see if I can um, share my screen. Um, and I ask you if you can see this slide. Yes, we can. Okay, good. Look, it's just a slide that comes from um, a collection of knowledge that's been put together by the IPCC from 2001 to 2018 in various reports. And, um, and I've just picked three particular um, systems that are influenced by climate change. On the left, you see a unique and threatened systems, which basically means ecosystems. In the middle, there's extreme weather events, which we're already too familiar with. And then what is called in scientific language, large scale singular events, you may be more familiar with the language tipping points. And what we can see is that in each of those reports, the risk, which is color coded from very little risk to white, um, going up to, to through yellow, high risk at red and very high risk at purple, um, increases as the temperature goes up on the left-hand side. You see 1.1 1, 1 .1 where we are now, um, 1.5 the Paris target, certainly no higher than two. And then the current path we're on, unfortunately, which is more like three. And if we look at Australia's past example of policies, that if the world adopted that, we'd be almost at four. Um, and what I wanted to just let everyone see visually is that as time has gone on, as those arrows have gone from 2001 to 2018, the colors get more and more intense, which is a way of saying the risk has gotten higher and higher, or our knowledge of that risk has gotten higher and higher. And this is why scientists are saying so much more now, um, even than they were 20 years ago, that we need to keep global 
global heating um, as close to 1.5 as we can. Um, really, even if you look even at two degrees, the risk to our ecosystems and extreme weather events are very high indeed. And we even are at some risk of tipping points at two degrees. So 1.5 is where we want to be. Uh, we can do it, but we can't do it by dragging our feet. We need to start acting right away. Thank Thanks. you. That's what I wanted to show you. Thanks, Penny. Um, if you could just press the, the stop on the screen sharing there, that would be great. Thank you. Richie, back to you. Yeah, um, that was uh, quite a wake-up call, Penny. I saw at one stage, it seems like you ran out of colors and, and there was an exclamation mark in, in some locations. Yes, that's because um, uh, we haven't even studied um, at three degrees and four degrees um, with the kind of precision we have at the lower degrees. So there's there's even a place of unknown mm. we would be heading unless we have rapid action. Thank you for that update. Um, Sally, for those who are unfamiliar with, with how bills become law, what are the next steps today is sort of, in a sense, the first um, of many, what are the next steps for the bill? And then what has been the reception to date when you have shared um, the work behind the bill with uh, fellow parliamentarians, particularly those who have similar electorates, you know, the modern liberals, say within Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane, yeah. Look, it's really important for me, a key goal is to try and bring a unifying collaborative approach to this. So I've met with many coalition backbenchers, I've met with Labor MPs, I've met with the Prime Minister, the Treasurer, the Opposition Leader, I've met with the Crossbench and I've met with Senators. So I really have done the rounds. I've had a lot of consultation with groups who have made, suggested amendments, some we have made, and some um, probably will be for consideration at a committee stage. So. The bill, as, a, as an independent, I'm not in government, so I can only introduce legislation via private members' business, which I did today. The bill is then I will be seeking for it to be referred to a committee for a public inquiry so that everyone gets to make a submission. I just really think it's well past time that we have a public debate about our climate policy, but what, not one driven by the media and a limited opinion, but one driven by submissions, driven by people the Australian people wanting to be heard, but also our organisations and our businesses, our key leading bodies like the AMA. We want them to make submissions that the government has to respond to, has to refer to. So the next process will be an inquiry um, process, I hope, and I will let you know of timelines for written submissions. We would then have public hearings, which is really important. We need to ventilate this. We need to take this issue away from the cycle of politics and elections where it just gets becomes a wedge politic issue as opposed to a long-term safety issue um, and then I will push for the bill to return to the house for a vote at the end of the day MPs say a lot of nice things at election time and especially a lot of modern liberals as they call themselves they claim to be committed to climate action but then they get in this place and they do not vote in accordance with those promises to their electorates and I think it's well past time that we pull back the curtain on what happens in Canberra and electorates need to hold their MPs accountable so this can happen several ways I strongly hope and urge the Prime Minister to be brave to show show the leadership he showed on COVID and do it on climate change. Step up, step up the government policy to get in line with international expectations and make this a bipartisan support. If he can't do that, because he has a group of minority MPs in the coalition party room who we know they are the fossils of this parliament. We know they're prepared to wreck the joint. But rather than 80% of MPs being held to ransom by this minority, make it a free vote, make it a conscience vote. This is not a policy about setting our long-term target and an accountability process to get there. It is up to government of the day to set the actual policy. So this is a moral issue and we can have a free vote on this. So all MPs should be given a free vote to vote for whether they support net zero by 2050 and a clear accountability path to get there. 
So there are many options. And, you know, I've written to the Prime Minister again last week, urging him to show leadership, to really be brave and come up uh, and put Australia on a safer path. We can't have a situation where communities are being evacuated because bushfires are raging and encircling them. Our defence forces are being called in. Um, we have complete cutoff. We have food and water security issues. We have farmers struggling. This is just not the future that we are, that we as a government, as, as a parliament, should be um, planning. This is not our, the legacy we want. So there are solutions on the table. Our trading partners are embracing those solutions. I'm a little bit at a loss as to why the Prime Minister is doubling down in the face of so much evidence to the contrary. It really does beg the question, is he so ideologically um, wedded to his current policy or is he just unable to step to take on board the new information because I want to be really clear this is not about looking at the past I am not trying to say who was right or wrong in the past all I'm saying is 2020 line in the sand let's get on with the job let's stop looking at the past let's leave those climate divisive politics behind and actually let's unite on a safer future we don't argue the need for a defence policy. We are all united in a parliament. All sides of politics agree that you have a defence force. So we should all be united on a net zero by 2050. Mm. It's interesting. It, it really is also a national security issue as much as, as it is an economic and an environmental and a, a moral issue. Uh, we, um, we're fortunate to um, also have uh, the Coalition Minister Matt Keane on a webinar to launch the Climate of the Nation this year. And we had the luxury of having you launch it last year, Zali, for which we're grateful as well. And Matt Keane talked about the forgotten Australians who are the ones who do want action on climate change and are often talked over or don't necessarily um, raise it as their first issue when they do talk to um, their political representatives and therefore their views are overridden or ignored. But is there an opportunity for, for those on this, we're you know, approaching almost a thousand on this call, but for the thousands of others who support this in one action, what, what is available uh, to them to help um, push their representatives, especially if they are modern liberals, to voice themselves and to provide a voice for those people? Look, it, the, the, there's no doubt the conversation is moving very quickly. We can see that internationally with our trading partners, with um, President-elect Biden, with the UK's Boris Johnson, but also locally. We had over 107 um, organisations and businesses sign a joint letter to parliamentarians about supporting the legislation, the Climate Change Act. Uh, there's been numerous press releases come out today from organisations from BCA to AIG to AMA wanting this uh, support, this to be legislated. We know 80% of the Australians are concerned about this issue. Um, I can tell you last weekend there were vigils and climate protests in front of the office of Dave Sharma in Wentworth and North Sydney for Trent Zimmerman and there has been many representations made to Jason Felinski and McKellar, they were neighbouring to me, but also Barnaby Joyce in New England, uh, in Hughes, you know, Craig Kelly, I would say another de uh, climate denier. Um, so again, this is happening all around the country, but everyone has to get engaged. I'm only one vote here and I'm one, I represent one electorate. I would say Warringah has done its bit. Every other electorate needs to do their bit as well. You have to engage with this because we will all pay the price. Uh, climate change impacts will not discriminate on political boundaries or political lines, it will impact everyone. In fact, those that tend to be taken advantage of in terms of denying the impacts of the need to transition are likely to be the communities most impacted by these changes and the ones most in need of a sensible plan. So I urge everyone, don't, you know, listen to, accept the fact, be factual about this, there's a lot of misrepresentation that goes on in this space. And I would say the US election has shown the time for lies and misrepresentation has to be over. We need to get on with facts and, and proper policy. Mm -hmm. um, 
Penny, on, on that sort of turning to truth, and it really is, feels like there's a momentum back to climate, but then also back to evidence-based approaches to these, to these wicked problems that we face. One of the issues in this you know, debate, if you want to call it debate, but really just in the conversation around climate has been this false narrative that the cost of climate action uh, is not necessarily worth it. Um, and what's missing from there is the cost of inaction. Uh, at a national level, you have the national interest being conflated with fossil fuel interests. How do you see sort of the, the evidence um, filtering through, um, which would be buoyed up by having an independent climate commission like the one Zali is proposing? Yes, I think uh, I believe very firmly in making decisions based on based on evidence. And um, that evidence has shown scientifically uh, what we now know about climate change, but economically, um, it's very clear that the impacts of, of say two degrees of warming, uh, the economic impacts would be huge um, and, and far outweigh acting. In fact, um, in many cases, it's actually uh, cost effective to act um, even if you, even if you ignore um, the the impacts, right? I mean, renewable energy now is is in most places of the world um, the cheapest form of new energy. So um, you know, economically, uh, from that standpoint, from the standpoint of our trading partners, what will our new exports look like? You know, we need green manufacturing because our trading partners are going to say, um, this is important to us. We're going to be keeping track of the emissions that we use to produce the products that we purchase. Um, and so it seems to me that the um, evidence has only gotten stronger that this is economically the way to go, as well as um, for our health, for our safety. Um, insurers know this, the business community is calling for this, the health community, um, farmers. So um, really, I think, you know, all the evidence is pretty much on one side of the scale at the moment, and and we have the tools. So there's no reason not to, not to really begin to plan to have a commission that can provide that advice and update that advice as we learn more and more, um, and to make those reports transparent and available to all. And I think that's vital as well. And you're talking from experience. This seems to be how it works at the ACT level. Yes, you know, here we are um, sitting on Ngunnawal land in the ACT, a little tiny jurisdiction. But in fact, we have a legislated body, an independent legislated body called the ACT Climate Change Council that I currently chair. And um, so that gives, you know, the government doesn't need to act on that advice, but it's there. And that advice is also uh, appears on our website so that anyone can read it. And we're mandated also to interact with, with the business community and the community at large in providing our advice. So um, I'm a firm believer in, in um, the value of that to governments and the value of that to the citizens they represent. Um, I might just jump in there. Thank you so much, uh, Penny and Zali. We might take a couple of questions from uh, <clears throat> the audience now. I did just want to point out um, to Penny's comments, um, obviously on the cost of climate inaction, I think we saw that really in action at the beginning of the year with the bushfires, smoke shut down the whole of Canberra for uh, virtually weeks on end. Uh, and we did see basically the whole of the south coast of New South Wales um, from Nowra south to the Victorian border at one point was a, called a tourist leave zone and they just ask all tourists uh, to leave the area. So there's certainly huge economic impacts there. And just very quickly, a reminder that we've held two green manufacturing webinars this year, one with Professor Ross Garneau and one with uh, Paul Bastian from the Australian Manufacturing Workers Union that you should check out and also the Centre for Future Work and the Australia Institute have published a couple of reports on that. So going now to the questions, the first one is from Christian Fletcher and this one's for you, Zali. Um, how can you ensure this legislation would be debated in the House? I imagine that the Prime Minister will try and stop this with all his might. 
Uh, sure. But again, this is does come down to uh, public pressure at the end of the day. Um, it's important, though, that we go through the committee process of a public inquiry, because, again, that means all the submissions that get made by very important groups and the public are on the public record. And so that means a very public position from everybody of what the case is for action and for good legislation. That report gets tabled to Parliament, so is on the record, as would any dissenting re report be. And that's the point at which I will be pushing for that vote to be had. Now, obviously, he can put his head in the sand and he can keep digging his heels in, but he is more and more isolated in that position. And the Australian people have to let him know that that goes against their wishes um, and, and you know uh, I can assure you the Prime Minister responds to his popularity polls and his approval ratings and MPs are very worried about getting re-elected they are worried about how many emails they receive on an issue and how many protests they have in front of their electoral office they do worry about these things I can assure you they worry about having their job after the next election so it is up to the Australian people to put that pressure on it's also also up to all the sectors, all the organisations that speak up. Every, go to your employer, ask them what is their policy? Are they committed to a net zero policy? What's their sustainability? What measures are they taking to offset their emissions? Everybody will be doing their bit. Thank you. Um, the next question is from uh, Claire Pisani, who asks, how can we address the reasonable fears of coal communities and employees um, that she spoke recently to a person who um, uh, runs a local labour branch and that people are, are very worried about the politics around that. Um, Zali, first, if I can come to you on that one. Yeah, I, I'm very worried for them as well because putting your he having an MP that puts your head, their head in the sand and pretends this disruption is not happening is not a service to those communities. Um, we've done some research about communities that are about sort of, you know, we often talk about biodiversity of environment, but there's also biodiversity of communities in terms of how many employers and the health of regional communities. The more variety there is in the employers and small businesses, the more healthy and, and the more um, uh, prosperous that community is. So there's a number of communities that are heavily exposed to a single employer or a dominant employer. And if anything happens to that industry or that employer, there is no backup plan. Those communities are highly exposed. Now, what this bill does is it mandates a risk assessment of that, of those communities that need a transition plan, and it puts it in place well in advance. So whether it is retraining, finding new opportunities, whether it is establishing new manufacturing zones, uh, new industries, providing transition packages for those communities and employees, this is important. But pretending this isn't happening is not a solution. It's going to happen. The transition is happening around the world. The key question for those communities, are you going to be on top of the, the transition? Are you going to have a plan in place? Or will you have had somebody representing you denying that this is happening for the last 10 years and find yourself out in the cold with no plan? So it really is important. That's why the Independent Climate Change Commission has to have certain skills around the table. We need an Indigenous voice. We need a regional development voice. We need an employment uh, voice. We, ne we need those uh, sectors around the table to make sure we're addressing every sector, not just gas executives the way the climate, the, co the COVID coordination commission has. We need scientists, but we also need economists and business people. We need the indigenous voice. We need water, uh, water and food security. We need regional development, jobs. Um, you know, we, we absolutely need all sectors around the table to make sure we have a plan. Um, and at the moment that's missing. Um, Richie, I might ask you quickly just to chime in here. Right at the beginning, you mentioned um, that some of uh, Australia's biggest customers for coal and gas uh, have adopted net, emission, net zero emissions by 2050. Um, can you just briefly speak to, I mean, obviously this government really heavily backs coal and gas, but that's actually not doing much to help the prospects of the coal and gas industry. No, not really. Um, just to add to... Zali's uh, point around uh, the transition work, 
part of the problem with the, the transition as well is that you have what is seen as good jobs in the mining industry. They pay well, they're secure, they've been around for a while. And, and the absence of the same kind of security of employment. Um, and we're seeing more and more of these gig jobs come up that are insecure or where there's often under uh, employment as well. So part of the picture, which we're certainly attuned to at the Australian Institute is how do you build better jobs as well? So it's not simply just having those replacements, but having the same kind of security of employment that most Australians want as well. And that's part of the same picture as, as we think about what society we want, not just to be back to normal, but to be a better version of Australia. And when it comes to mining, um, yes, Australia is often perceived to be highly reliant on its coal and gas. Yes, Australia is the largest coal exporter in the world. It's the largest exporter of liquefied natural gas, but it's not as important as we think it is for our economy, which is good to some extent because the importers, the three major importers are all flagging that they're going to start tailing that down and, and doing so quite soon. Um, the most interesting thing around that is what we found in the Climate of the Nation 2020, when we asked Australians, to what extent do you think um, you know, the Australian workforce is engaged in gas exploration? They got it wrong by a factor of 40. So whilst there's only about what, less than 30,000 Australians working in the gas extraction sector, Australians think that that number is over a million. And it was similarly incorrect when it came to coal mining. And it's the same thing again when it comes to the size of the gas industry in terms of its economic weight and the size of the coal industry in terms of its economic weight. Australia is not as reliant as it thinks it is, nor are there as many Australians employed. That is actually a benefit because it means that we can transition. It won't be as harmful as we think it is. And we have the means to make sure that that's just as well. So there's a lot of work that, that, that needs to be done, but at the same time, Australia is in a really strong position to do so, um, unlike some of the smaller petro nations um, that are highly reliant and don't have alternatives to go to. Uh, the next question is for you, Zali, but I'm actually going to flick it to you first, Penny. Um, someone has asked about, um, does Zali support Labor's approach of the use of natural gas as a transition energy source, or should they be pushing harder to go straight to renewable energy sources and bypass gas as much as possible. If I can come to you first on the science, Penny, what role is there for gas there? Yes, yeah, so, um, you know, you may have heard that the emissions from gas uh, are less than that from coal when uh, they're used in the electricity sector, which is generally true, especially if you're talking about CO2, maybe 30, as much at most as 50% less. Um, however, that first of all neglects um, the effects of methane that um, are part of, of the extraction process. Um, and methane is a very, very potent greenhouse gas. But probably most importantly is that um, gas as a transition fuel is really an idea that's about 20 years old. Um, and those countries that got started on it 20 years ago have, have seen some benefit to their emissions because of that. But right now, the time that we have to transition quickly is so short um, and that we really need to skip over gas. I don't mean that there won't be any gas at all used in the system, not at all. It has a role, it has a firming role, but it's not as though we're going to replace coal with gas. We're going to replace coal with renewables. We know how to do it, we can do it, and there's no reason to do anything that, that is second, third, or fourth best. Um, we, can, we can just go straight to renewables. And the time scale, if we're talking about 1.5 degrees, the time scale says um, that both gas and coal have to decline um, over the next 10 to 20 years. So we can't be increasing gas, we actually need to decrease it as well. Uh, and probably worth pointing out uh, the point you made earlier that renewables are cheaper, the cheapest new form of energy to build at the moment. But Zali, if I can come back to you on the politics of that, obviously all political parties um, have different views when it comes to climate. I, I agree with that. I think, I think we've lost your uh, audio a bit there, Zali. Can you hear us? Yes. You're just not on a very strong connection at the moment. 
I'm sorry, everyone. And I'm yeah, sorry. Look, I'm really yeah, there we go. Uh, there we go. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah that's I can hear better. <laughs> now, yes, no. <laughs> anyway, um, I'd have to say, look, I really have to call Labor out on that policy because that's just, you know, and that's half the problem we have on climate politics uh, in Australia is um, they're still playing cute about it. And that's why I think then people are not genuinely convinced that they are committed to a strong climate policy. And that's why this needs to be bipartisan. We need to be really clear about this. There is no role for more gas. We have the Australian energy market operator who establishes every year an integrated system plan, which makes very clear what requirements we have. There is enough gas in the system already. We do not need to increase and we certainly don't need to be extracting more and opening up new basins. What we can look at is how much do we export and the difference between what the price it's exported at and the price at which it's available domestically. But we also need to progress our building codes. For example, residential use. We should have up Building codes that require Sally. new developments to have renewables, to have batteries, to have smart meters. Get rid of having. Sally, we can't hear very well there again. So that I'm we really don't sorry. have an increase in demand for gas. It's there to an extent. To, it, I agree with Penny. It will always play some part. It is just not an increase. Um, thanks, Ali. We're having trouble with your audio there, um, so we might just have to get a clarification on some of those um, <laughs> remarks later. But basically, you're saying that um, you know there's there's really no place for for gas at the moment, and Labor's on the wrong. Um, can you hear me better if I go off video? Yeah, that sounds a bit better. No. Yep. Lost me. No, we can still hear you. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we might have to, uh, if we can't get you back there, um, we might just have to wrap up and let you get to question time. Um, but thank you very much uh, for that. And yes. I think Zali was speaking <laughs> then to um, a lot of points about um, the role of you can smart hear me. meters. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, look, I think um, we, we need to, Uh, I'm really sorry about this, everyone. This is a shame right at the end of the um, at the end of the webinar. Zali, can you hear us there? We've got you on mute at the moment. Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah. There we go. That sounds a bit better. Um, I was just going to ask you just to repeat some of those last points that you were making. I don't know. <laughs> No, we can't. We can't get Zali back there. I'm going to put her on. Um, so sorry, doesn't have a good one. Yeah. Far. No, we're going to have to wrap it up there. I'm afraid. Uh, we might take one more question. Yeah. Look, I don't know where it cut out, but we we don't need more gas. Oh. We are... Zali, I'm just going to have. We can't hear you at all. You're coming in really poorly. Can you? Um, sorry, everyone. Um, to, yeah, can, can you, Sally? Can you please go on mute because the audio is is really distracting in the background. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really sorry for those uh, audio issues there and the trouble that we've had uh, at the end. I will go back just to one last question before we wrap up. Um, we want to thank Zali for her time and she did have to go in any case in a couple of minutes because she has to get to question time. Um, but uh, the next question uh, that I had and now I've lost it um, is was one around the role of the state governments, which actually might not be a question for Zali. Um, Richie, I'll come to you first and then to you, Penny. Um, obviously, today we've seen uh, the New South Wales Environment Minister, Matt Keane, make an enormous 
uh, announcement about renewables in New South Wales, but just how much of a role are state governments playing in the absence of um, any policy federally? Mm. States and territories can play a huge role. A great example is in the United States. So there, when Trump decided to pull out of the Paris Agreement, you had a number of state governments band together in the We Are Still In movement, um, as well as thousands of organizations, cities, mayors across the board. Collectively, they represented, I think, the sixth largest emitter in the world if they were their own country. A really quite an, an impressive coalition. And through that, took a lot of state action. And we're seeing a similar thing forming here. In the absence of a credible climate and energy policy from the federal government, in the absence of a long-term strategy, you see every state and territory government take on a net zero by 2050 target, if not better in the ACT's case. And then you're also seeing ambitious renewable energy policies. The most important thing to do is to address the electricity. It remains the highest emitting sector, about a third of our national emissions. Once you can actually switch your electricity, then you can successfully switch transport by electrifying it. You can switch more of industry over to electricity, which will then be clean as well. Um, and then you can look at what you can do in the land sector to accommodate that too. So a lot of action can take place. It is taking place and we'd like to see more of it. Yeah, Penny, is there anything that you'd like to add there about the role that state governments can play? Yes, I just I just underline that um, even before uh, the U.S. pulled out of the Paris Agreement, um, some several states on the East Coast formed something called Reggie R G G I, um, and they came to an agreement to um, set a cap on emissions for the highest emitters in the power sector there. They found that not only were they able to over, um, over many years uh, decrease emissions every year, but their economies grew at the same time. So um, I think this is something that in a way is understood better on the ground in local government. Um, they, they, un they have to often pay the price for for natural disasters, um, they 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 know what's happening in the hospitals when when smoke is is coming into schools. So um, I think that local government um, really has perhaps understood more quickly um, why this is such an important issue and why it can help their economies. The ACT now sources 100% of its electricity from renewables, um, which is quite. Uh, quite an achievement, and that's what is um, enables the ACT to now embrace electric vehicles um, and know that it can start to pull down its transport emissions, as you said, Richie, at the same time. So um, I'm I'm just delighted to see um, both flavor major flavors of government at the state level in Australia um, try to tackle this, and I think that this climate change bill is a way for the Australian Commonwealth government to have their backs and get behind them um, and do the things that only the Commonwealth can do um, to make that transition happen even faster. Well, we're gonna to have to wrap it up there. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you to Zali, who we apologize, uh, had to leave a bit early and also apologies for the terribly poor internet connection at Parliament House. You'd think it might be a bit better up there, but sadly it's not. Um, thank you, Penny Sackett. Thank you, Richie Merzian. And thank you all of you for coming along today. That was a huge response. Um, and we've got some more exciting webinars coming up, not only this week, but next week. So on Wednesday, we're gonna be talking childcare reforms with former South Australian Premier Jay Weatherall and former ACT Chief Minister Kate Carnell and how uh, childcare reforms could really power the economic recovery. On Thursday, we've got our next Economics Academy with Richard Dennis and Matt Grudnoff. It's never too late to sign up for that. Once you signed up, you'll get access to all the content from Economics Academy. On this Friday at 11 a.m., we'll be talking friends, allies and enemies with Karen Middleton, an editor of Australian Foreign Affairs, Jonathan Perlman, along with Alan Bean from the Australia Institute. That one should be interesting in light of the US election results. And then next Wednesday, for those of you who are interested in climate, we're going to be talking about the need for a climate disaster levy with Lord Mayor Clover Moore, 
Ken Thompson, who's the former Deputy Commissioner of Fire and Rescue New South Wales, and Fiona Lee, who's from the Bushfire Survivors for Climate Action Group. Make sure you're subscribed to our podcast, Follow the Money. You can find that on iTunes or wherever you normally listen to podcasts. And remember, everyone, stay one and a half metres away, keep washing your hands, wear a mask if you can, and stay safe out there. Thanks very much for joining us, and we'll see you hopefully on Wednesday, Friday, or Wednesday next week. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks.